Good morning. Thank you for being here again. Ray, would you like to start off? You need to whether you want to or not. Uh, no, okay. It, that's all working? Okay. Yep. Thank you. Good morning and thanks for the opportunity to uh, make this presentation. I'm going to talk about uh, the role of life cycle models in decision making and then more generally about uh, resolving scientific uncertainty. Let's see if I can understand how to do Oops, no, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Let's try that. Ah, God help me. Uh, no. How do I get this thing to go forward now that I'm here? Net go. Oh, I don't want to have to do that. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, that almost uh, most decision making can be thought of within the uh, the concept of adaptive management, which is more or less uh, learn learning, learning by doing in many flavors. Uh, but within the broader area of decision theory or the scientific approach to decision making, uh, the core of decision theory is always evaluating the support d the data provide for competing models and evaluating alternative actions across the range of competing models. So in uh, what is often called active adaptive management, you experimentally manipulate the system to inform models. In passive adaptive management, you update the models and the support the data provide as data accumulate and your data uh, decisions depend upon data that have been collected. And then in, in non-adaptive management, you simply choose a policy based on your best knowledge at the time and you assume that there's no further information going to be collected that could change your decisions. Now, which button do I push? The gray one? The upper left? Okay. So uh, the core of any policy evaluation for fish has to be life cycle models. You, you simply have to consider the factors that affect the survival through the entire life. You can't just look at one stage in the life history and one factor. You have to evaluate how much different factors uh, su uh, affect uh, different survival through different stages and potentially how those interact. Um, so what do life cycle models have them? They, they move fish through their life history. Uh, in general, they calculate the survival from one stage to the next depending upon environmental conditions. And these environmental conditions can be natural conditions, temperature, et cetera, and they can obviously be human actions such as flow regulation or harvest. Um, and the uncertainty in models or the uncertainty in what we know is primarily associated with how different factors affect survival and the intensity of that effect. So if we say, well, we're uncertain about this, it means we simply don't know exactly how much factor X affects survival at life stage Y. Um, just as, you know, as, as an example, uh, we would typically, inside a model, relate fish survival, there on the y-axis, to some environmental factor. And you might have, uh, those are just three possible relationships. Uh, and I think it's important to note that in general, we can't, uh, ex we can't say with certainty that one of those is true. We'll almost always have competing relationships that are roughly consistent with the data. And that's why I always say you have to consider across a range of possible models. Um, so there are several roles for life cycle models, and one is just measurement of uncertainty. So you, you consider a, a series of alternative models. There is no single model. You have to be considering the range of alternative explanations. That's the scientific method. And at any point in time, we use the data to determine how much support uh, the alternative models have. Does the data most consistent with model A, B, or C? And the result isn't a single model that's the best model. It's a degree of belief in each of the competing models. Now, some of these may have so little support from the data, we effectively discard them. But in almost any resource situation I've ever been involved in, you're left in hand with, a, with certainly more than one alternative model or more hypothesis about how the factors you control affects survival. Uh, and a, a central part of, of, of decision making is the control rules. That is, uh, in, in the delta, or in, again, almost any problem I can think of, management actions are taken in relation to data that are collected. So in marine fisheries or even in the delta, it could be fish surveys, could be environmental conditions. And so the control rules describe how your actions depend upon what you know. 
uh, and uh, and uh, these the life cycle models play a critical role in designing alternative control rules. So the first step is you consider your range of alternative models. Then you take a range of possible control rules and you evaluate the consequences under each alternative model. Uh, and what you get as an output is the consequences of taking that, using that control rule if, uh, if that, they, that, that model happened to be true. And uh, I, you know, in a perfect world or a great world, you would find one control rule that worked well across the range of alternative hypotheses or alternative models. Can I interrupt just a, a second? Sure. Um, does it, uh, yesterday we heard, uh, and you weren't here, so I, I, that's why I'm uh, asking this. Um, yesterday we, did, we heard about several life cycle models that are being worked on now by various, uh, uh, one on smelt and, and some on different, uh, different runs of salmon, and um, uh, but we also heard about the time sequence. You know how how frequently is the data that's being gathered? Uh, you know how frequently is it collected? Is it for monthly? Is it monthly or is it annually or is it weekly or daily? Uh, from your pers from your experience with these various models, particularly having to do with life cycle. Uh, it, it, does that matter? I mean, you, do you, how much weight should we be giving to those models that use shorter time periods, like daily or weekly versus monthly? I, I don't think there's a, a simple answer, answer to that, mm -hmm. um, that most of the life cycle models I'm familiar with typically run on an annual time step, but the control rules may depend, you know, on, on on things that are measured on a, on a weekly or a daily basis. Um, so, uh, okay. for instance, in salmon management, we actually collect data daily in Alaska and we adjust our harvest based, based on that, although the underlying model is, is both daily and, uh, and annual. So, okay. um, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't say a priori that a model that runs daily is better than a model that runs annually. Uh, that, they, they, that you need to evaluate the, the well, there's a whole bunch of things you'd have to do to see how much benefit there is going through daily. Um, okay, what, so what I want to emphasize is that the output is always not an answer, but it's a range of consequences. And given that almost all natural resource management is multi-objective, you then have a whole range of consequences, whether it's the, you know, economic, social, biological. And then to choose the, the, the control rule, there is no science won't tell you what the right control rule was. It always involves trade-offs, and those trade-offs are intrinsically political. So when people say, oh, we want our decision-making to be scientific, that's incredibly naive. You want the science to inform the consequences of the decisions, but science won't tell you whether we should, uh, uh, whether we should harvest fish at level X or Y. Uh, you know, the science will simply tell you the consequences. It won't tell you the right answer, and there's always uh, some form of, of political or social objective that goes into what you actually end up doing. Um, now, the, the, the best, uh, or I say the most powerful use of these kinds of models, it's what's often called in the, in the fisheries management world, management procedure evaluation. And in that, what you do is you uh, ask, how would the total system behave if different hypotheses were true? So again, you, you, you have a range of alternative hypotheses about how the system works, and they take the form of different life history models, or even it can be the same model with different sets of parameters. And the system is control rules, okay, how are we going to regulate the system, the data collection, what are we going to measure, and then how you're going to evaluate what you measure. So, uh, Ray, Ray, you mentioned earlier um, the factors under your control. Um, with pelagics, I guess it's one thing. With the anadromous fish, there's a significant portion of the life cycle that goes on for years that is totally beyond your control. So, you know, on a lot of things we have, have gone on the premise that we're going to do the best for the things that are under our control, uh, but if the things beyond our control or overriding, there isn't much we can do about it. The other school of thought is you 
overcompensate or do your best to mitigate for the things that are under your control in hopes that you overpower those that are not. And it, 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 to me, it's a, it's a ball of yarn, quite frankly. Uh, you know, you mentioned Alaska and anadromous mm -hmm. fish. You know, how, I'm not sure how this all fits together with the things that are not under our control. Well, okay, any, any salmon model has a lot that's not under your control, particularly the ocean. But you have to consider, through your life cycle model, the consequences. Let's say, for instance, if there's density-dependent processes in the ocean, if there's not density-dependent processes in the ocean, or if ocean upwelling affects survival, or if it doesn't. So those are all elements in your, your life cycle model. And, uh, and so the work I, we did for uh, the CalFed process, you know, we had... Uh, what, you know, alternative models were: Does ocean upwelling affect Chinook survival or not? And uh, and you 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 know you need to go through and complete that life cycle across the, the uncertainties about what the ocean is going to do for you. And there's obviously a lot of uncontrollable elements in the freshwater life history as well. Um, but you can't just look at one life stage uh, in, if, if you're worried about what comes back from the ocean ultimately. And obviously, in, in salmon fisheries, you've got salmon harvesting. And that's, that's got to be part of your evaluation procedure. You've got to look at the consequences under different harvests, as well as the consequences under different freshwater human activities. So this is just a schematic about how this, this, this should be done. You, you have the upper left-hand corner, you've got this model you assume to be true. That's your hypothesis about what's really going on. Then, then you sample that to get a, uh, an, a, 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 a sorry, a, to get what data you collect. From that, you assess that data that ultimately gives you your degree of belief in alternative models because you've got a model you assume to be true, but you're checking, testing to see if you would identify that as being the correct model or how much support the data would provide for other hypotheses. You go into the control rule. That then leads to management actions. And then you just cycle around this process uh, for multiple years. And then you do that across different true models. And you look, hope to find a control rule, a sampling program, and an assessment method that's robust to which model is really true. Um, what you should, as policymakers, you should ask about proposed management actions, whether they're adaptive or non-adaptive, is has their outcomes been quantitatively evaluated across competing models? Uh, has the, uh, uh, do, do these competing models represent the range of uncertainty? That, that, you know, to ask a bunch of experts to tell you their best guess, that doesn't, that, that isn't good enough because there's always going to be uncertainty about what is really going on in nature. Uh, you should also ask slash demand that alternative control rules be evaluated. To just have one set of controls laid in front of you uh, assumes that whoever did that knows what the correct political choice is. And, uh, and even if you're not adaptive, even if you're not going to be monitoring and updating, you still need to uh, ask across uh, a range of competing models because there's always uncertainty at any point in time. And I'm running low on time, so um, I'll just uh, sort of switch topics here and talk about one project I was involved in where we had enormous uh, debate and, uh, and, and uncertainty um, and a process that worked pretty well, uh, in fact, remarkably successful. And this was a, a headline from a news article in Science Magazine about uh, about our process, and our process began, oops, oh, now is this the back button? No, oh dear, um, oops, how do I go back? Okay, that's where I want to be, okay. Um, uh, this is the group that was involved in sort of resolving this uncertainty about what's the status of fisheries? Are they all collapsing or are they not? All right. Uh, Thanks. And it began with a paper that was published in 2006 uh, uh, that forecast that all fish stocks would be collapsed by 2048. Uh, made the front page of the New York Times, front page of the Washington Post, I bet it made, and the LA Times, made the front page of every place in the world, it seemed. And, uh, and it was so contrary to the experience of many of us who work in marine fisheries that we wrote a bunch of very snarky replies to the journal Science. Mine was that this was mind-boggling stupid. Uh, and, 
the, uh, so I wrote a critique that was published. Uh, uh, Rick Mathot, Steve Murawski, who were senior NOAA scientists, uh, did. Uh, that, that it was clearly there were lots of places in the world that were sustainably managed, and so therefore they weren't all going to be gone. And what happened is the lead author, Boris Worm, and I initiated a series of conversations. We identified a very clear objective, which was to understand what abundance data tells us about trends in abundance and status, because the original paper that caused the controversy used catch data, not abundance data. And then we assembled a team that represented all the different perspectives, and we were very careful to identify what data we were going to be using. Uh, so the basic lessons are first that our objectives were scientific, not policy. All we were asking our group to decide is what do we know about the status of fisheries? How many are overexploited? How many are collapsed? Uh, and that very narrow focus made our job much, much easier. Uh, with respect to participants, we clearly needed representation from a whole bunch of perspectives. So Boris and I each put together sort of five or six people that, uh, that we thought represented our particular view. Uh, we excluded several well-known people because we just knew they would dominate the whole process. Um, and then uh, I think a very important part to our success is we had a large contingent of young postdocs, and they, A, they actually did the work, because old people like me don't do any work anymore. And the other is that they weren't, they hadn't, didn't have long track records of publishing on this or that, uh, and they, they formed a group, even though there were, some were mine, some were Boris's, they worked very well together, they still worked closely together, uh, and they weren't, they, they weren't uh, hobbled by past uh, publication and past experience. Uh, the lesson, the data have to be the focus of the work. We assembled a public database that was available for everyone to explore. It's available on the World Wide Web now. And, uh, and it also meant that during the process, anyone who thought there was something fishy going on could look at the data and analyze it themselves. Uh, so in summary, models are an essential component of management under uncertainty. And uh, m there, is, there is no Uber model. Uh, the, you use whatever models you can put together at the time of your decision. You, can, you, know, you can't wait until someone's ideal model is ready. You, if you have to make a decision in six months, use the models that can be ready to run in, in six months. Modeling is an incremental process. There is no perfect model. There is no final stage in the development. And achieving sci cons scientific consensus is possible if the structure of the process is properly defined. And thank you very much. But, but wait, <laughs> what's the punchline <laughs> on international fish? What oh, happened? Uh, that bo that, there, that all fish will not be gone by 2048. <laughs> no, no. That, uh, is it in process, or what's the? No, oh, no, no. We, the, the, for the fisheries where we have good data, which is the developed countries, uh, fish uh, are actually rebuilding, not declining. About uh, a third of them would be classified as overfished at the moment, and that number is declining. Uh, for the rest of the world, we didn't deal with in that project, but we've, our group has subsequently followed up, and they appear to be in roughly the same shape, but they appear to be continuing to decline rather than increasing in abundance. So that's a more sophisticated, subtle response than the one you thought was ridiculous. So are yeah. you and Steve Palumbi still friends? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, Felicia, the punchline is to remove dominant personalities from the discussion. <laughs> I, I vote for that. I won't mention the names of the people that we excluded, but uh, <laughs> there were a couple. <laughs> Questions? Thank you. Okay. Mr. O'Loughlin. Speaking of dominant personalities. Yeah. <laughs> Is it an option? After listening, <laughs> after listening to the wow. previous presenter, Kim, I hate to tell you, but you've been eliminated. <laughs> I've been voted off the island. You've been voted off the island. This is not a bad thing. Just remember, all press is good press. <laughs> I'm glad you don't have thin skin. You know. When you come from an Irish family of eight, it's yeah. kind of hard to have thin skin. Um, I just realized that I didn't give my introduction this morning and yes. tell you all the things I'm supposed to tell you and to turn off your cell phone, so I apologize because I'm not going to do it. To turn off your cell phone? But you do know how to evacuate if there's an emergency siren that goes off, I hope, or you're in big trouble and so am I.
thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and board members. Uh, Tim O'Loughlin, uh, Doug Demko is with me again today representing the San Joaquin Tributaries. Uh, per, uh, Dr. Uh, Bardroff uh, had to leave yesterday, but based on what we heard from Fish and Game yesterday in their presentation, uh, we felt that there was probably little or no need for him to stay around and uh, pound home a point that we've been making since 1995. Um, yesterday in the presentation that was made, um, Fish and Game stated that their analysis was always based about flow. Um, I, I find that ironic since 1995, um, the standard that's been in place has been a narrative objective, which is the natural production of anadromous fish. It's never been about flow. It's been about the narrative objective. Flow, from your perspective, is a tool to implement the narrative objective. So it's never been about flow. It, it could have been about a myriad of other factors, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, you want to flip? Um, so since 1991, uh, and since I've been in this process, um, we've always heard this equation, more flow equals more fish. So originally there was a linear regression, and then in 2005, uh, the California Department of Fish and Game came out with model 1.0 and 1.6. Um, and we've been fighting ever since then that a simple model, which is basically flow equals population, doesn't work. So we provided exhaustive comments to you and your staff back in 2005. We provided it on the model. And we provided it on the linear regression. Um, so we can go through all of that or kind of skip to the punchline, which is this. Uh, what we heard yesterday uh, from the California Department of Fish and Game is that um, uh, this is, well, this is from your report. Um, your report, your technical report says that additional flow is needed to significantly improve production abundance of fall run and especially escapement 2.5 years later. Um, and so you had, you, and that's, that's your technical report. And that technical report was based on the linear regression analysis and was based on model 1.0 and 1.6. So yesterday when Mr. Marston was here, he put up a chart and actually it's the, his chart was very similar to our submittal chart, which basically says that the model doesn't replicate reality, the model doesn't replicate anything and has little or no predictive capability. So in essence, just throwing water at the system isn't going to get you more population. And we agree with that because it's more complex than that. And that's actually why the California Department of Fish and Game, rightly so, has gone to a SALSIM model uh, to look at other factors, which we identified in our original critique of the model, uh, that may have an influence on population objectives. Um, so why don't we scroll down? Those are the linear regressions. We're not going to go, basically, this is the first linear regression, 1991. Uh, and just really quickly on this, go back one slide, please, so you can understand the, um, the data sets here, or you can keep it on that one. I don't know. Yeah. How do you move back? Okay. He's having trouble okay. scrolling back. Yeah, so, so here's, here's one of the things about this. So one of, the, <coughs> one of our problems with this, just and this puts it in context of what you're doing on the San Joaquin River. So you look at this time series. Basically, this time series is March 1st through May 31st, okay? So right away, any analysis or documentation that you're trying to do for February through June is not included in these linear regression analysis, okay? The second point is, if you look down along the axis along the bottom talking about the flow rate, those flow rates are the average monthly f daily flow rates over the 90-day period. So if you look, you will see, let's say, 20,000. That's 20,000 uh, CFS for uh, 90 days. So 20 times 2 is 40,000 acre feet times 90 days is 3.6 million acre feet of water flowing out of the system. On a normal system, that has about a total runoff of 5.8. And our complaint has always been, and still is, that if the state board is looking to do something, and you've identified it as 20 to 60 percent, where you're really at is that little box over on the left. And if you can scroll to the next two slides. So we updated it 
you're still in the lower left, and there's a reason why you're in the lower left. So here's, here's a slide we put together. So at 2,500 CFS for, th for 90 days, so that's 5,000 acre feet, okay, for 90 days is what this graph is telling you you will need. But if you look at the graph, you can see the distribution. In some years when you're releasing 2,500 CFS for uh, 90 days, you're at or near getting zero fish. And then the same 2,500 uh, CFS, you're all the way up to, you know, 40 or 50,000 acres, uh, 40 or 50,000 fish. So the whole point was is that flow alone doesn't explain the equation. You can skip to the next slides. So we're going to skip Dr. Barr. This was one interesting thing. Based on the analysis that Fishing Game had done, if you looked over the last 10 years in the, pre in the analysis that he did, actually the regression is negative. It's not positive. So the regression analysis over the last 10 years doesn't work at all. Next slide. This is some more statistical analysis that's explained in his report. And then, and then here's, here's the key, and you're going to hear this when we get to the fish and game model. The, the regression analysis really has no predictive power. So what you're trying to do is get a model that not only represents reality, but is going to try to tell you in some way or fashion, if you take certain management actions, what you can expect to get out of a management action. So if you look at 2008 or 2007, you know, and this, this is where the model fell apart when Fish and Game put it together. You look at these huge uh, predictive uh, capabilities and look at the spread. I mean, in 2008, the red dot is what we actually got back. And based on the model, we could have expected up to 400,000 fish back. So what, how helpful is that to you as state board members? If you're looking to try to get back 78,000 fish in a system, and now all of a sudden the spread is all the way up to 400,000, what kind of reliability do you have or faith that that model is going to accurately represent what type of management decisions and what kind of expectations you expect to get from a model? That's just uh, his beat down on why simple regression analysis aren't a good way to go, which we've already heard here in spades. So then Fishing Game put together a population model. They've already told you that this model's, um, um, well, this is going to present a problem for you. So from my perspective, what's happened is your staff has adopted the Fishing Game 1.0 and 1.6 as the basis for its technical report. Uh, since I've been here uh, in 1991 to the present, this board has always stated to, to the regulated community that you're going to use the best available science. And, and you've made that commitment to the regulated community. Well, what I heard yesterday, and Fishing Game's here, and they might come back up later and provide supplemental comments to you, is Fishing Game has now told you that Model 1.0 and 1.6 are not the best available science. Well, it's, they're clearly not the best. They're available. So the question that uh, Fran Spivey Weber asked yesterday was, well, when is it going to be, quote, available? Because you have a process that's ongoing that you're going to be doing in the near future, and the problem for you now is you've got an SED coming out on the street. You've already been told that the, that the underpinnings for that report really aren't there, and you've been told by Fish and Game that the science isn't the best science and that the better science is going to be here sometime between now and when you adopt new flow objectives. So that's going to be interesting for you how you handle that situation. Um, one other thing, and a quick aside on the on the model, these comments. Uh, this is how the model was put together, and we can screen to these comments that were made uh, by Dr. Lorden and Dr. Bar Bartroff in regards to the uh, fishing game population model are also probably going to be embedded in regards to the South Sim model. We have some real questions and concerns, and Doug and I will go over a couple specific points in a, in, a, in a few minutes about why we have concerns even before South Sim hits the street about what South Sim is all about. Um, one of the interesting things as well is from a management perspective and a data perspective is uh, Chairman Hoppen, you asked yesterday, well, what's driving the model? Are we looking for natural production of anadromous fish? Are we looking for hatchery fish? 
Well, we already know in the San Joaquin system that on two rivers, the Stanislaus and the Tuolumnes, that do not have any hatcheries, that on the, over the last several years, we've had 60 to 80 percent of the hatch, uh, fish returning have been hatchery fish. Well, what's, what's going to drive your model? What's going to drive your equations? What's going to drive your management decisions if what you're basing your model on is hatchery fish when, in fact, your requirement under the narrative objective is for the natural production, natural production of anadromous fish? Um, so this is, this is uh, our graph, which is similar to Mr. Marston's draft which basically shows that the model that they put together has actual, absolutely no predictive capability at all. And it's especially true when we ran the model through the series of times and basically what, the, what it shows once again is you have these huge sp spreads of where you would predict things to happen. They don't happen in that. In fact, they actually happen mostly at the lower end of the scale. So we agree with this critique actually uh, fairly simple sim simple spreadsheet model is probably an overstatement um, we don't even think it was that and then the questions they weren't new these questions we have stated since 1995 to the present in regards to the model and so now what they've told you is in their peer review or they've done a peer review and other ones that have been done that they're going to now look at all these other factors and put together uh, a life cycle model what we've been saying to you is we support the development of life cycle model. Um, but we have some questions and concerns because what's funny about it is Fish and Games put together model. They self-graded themselves at 88 percent yesterday. I found that ironic because quite frankly, based on the expert testimony that was given yesterday about how the model should be developed and actually the last speaker as well, how the model should be developed, how the data set should be implemented, how the public should be involved. I would give Fish and Great Game an F. Uh, it was done behind closed doors. It was done secretively. Nobody knew about this. I mean, we found out two weeks ago. We have the data sets from our own rivers. We were never asked. We were never approached to put inputs into the model. And so now what's going to happen is we're going to get this life cycle model dumped on us. And as Dean said quite, quite correctly yesterday, what, there was 20,000 lines of code? And we're going to have to go through all those lines of code and figure out what the data sets are that were used to put into that model to understand it. So we're going to show you some examples of some of the problems that the model will probably have. Let's go to the uh, weir one. Just skip all the way down to the weir. Skip, skip, skip. Is it not moving? No, it's slowly. So Doug's going to handle this one about <laughs> the difference between what we see and what they count. So the, well, let me back up here for a minute. Um, can we back up one slide? Sure. So as we've been hearing, there's a, a lot of different inputs that, that go into to models. And there's been a lot of models developed in the last uh, decade or two, and almost all of them have been out of um, the San Joaquin Basin, where I would say that um, Chinook populations and, and issues facing Chinook have been a, a higher priority than they have been in, in the San Joaquin Basin. But when you're developing a model, I think a life cycle model, these would probably be the, the, the six major areas where you need significant um, good solid data input for. Um, the first one being spawning, when the fish are coming back in the fall and they spawn in the, the fall and the winter time. Incubation, when those eggs are, 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 are laying in the gravel. Um, juvenile rearing, uh, December through May, when the juveniles are, are living in the river feeding. Um, the migration period, which is roughly January through, through May. The time they live in the ocean, and it was mentioned that um, this is the, the longest period in our life cycle, two to, 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 to three years, and the time when they're most difficult to research and when we know the, the least about them, and then adult migration. So these are the, the basic areas where we want as, as solid inputs as possible. And if we just go to, to, to number one, when I think about the, the, the number of individuals returning to the river, it seems to me that the time that um, fish are, well, you know, fish are just inherently difficult to research and to monitor because they live in water. Um, and they often live in turbid water where they're, where they're difficult to see. 
But the time when I would think that we would have the, the best and most accurate data is when they're back in the river, they're, they're dead, so they're pretty much not moving, and they're, they're, they're two to three feet long. And when you look at um, the longest time series of data that we have in the San Joaquin Basin, it's the carcass surveys. Um, the state goes out and estimates, they count the dead carcasses and estimate the number of fish that return to spawn every year in the Stanislaus River as well as most of the tributaries based on the number of, of dead carcasses. And um, that's pretty much the way we get the, the, that we have the most historic data set in California, how we estimate the number of fish that have been returning to all of our tributaries, at least the ones without, without ladders. So about 10 years ago, with the support of uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the water districts on the Stanislaus River wanted to evaluate to determine how accurate those carcass surveys um, are. So we put a weir in the river which effectively blocks all of the fish migrating into the system. They can't jump over the weir, they can't walk around it, they can't dig under it. There's only one place where the fish can actually pass through the weir and there's an electronic system there that takes a picture of them, scans them, and, and, and takes a video clip. So it's just an inherently accurate system. And when we compare the nine years that we have data for, what we see is that the carcass surveys um, were um, over 40% off for five of the nine years that we have data for. And they underestimated the population by 40% or more for four of those nine years. And you can see in one year, it's an underestimate of almost 60%. So um, the time that we really should, the time when fish are easiest to count, we still have challenges counting those fish. So I think um, the, the take home message for this is that um, all of our model inputs, just because fish are difficult, you know, inherently difficult to, um, to monitor and count, we need to view with some skepticism the accuracy of the data that we've, we've, we've got to feed these models. Is it because of well, scavengers, Doug, or just that they're not able to cover every nook and cranny when the hackers go up the streams? I think it's it's a combination of factors. Uh, the way carcass surveys are performed, it's it's they're not out there. You can't be out there every day counting the fish. So it's a matter of um, being on the river, I believe, um, for a full week, every other week. Um, and the factors we have not been able to find a correlation. Is it due to high flow years, low flow years, high fish abundance, low fish abundance? With some more sampling, additional years of this, we may be able to find a correlation. Um, the year that the, the, the we have the most accurate, that the comparisons were closest, was actually the year that the abundance was, was lowest. Um, flows were also low. But in another flow yo, year, low flow year, two years prior to that, where abundance was also relatively low, um, we, had a, we were off by about 50%. So it's, it's really challenging to say. Because the variation tend to range between 40 and 50%. You said something about 80 in one year, I mean, is it consistent enough that with the monitoring on the weirs, you could put a factor on the the number that were of carcasses that were That's counted and extrapolate out? That was the hope: is that you could develop, you could figure out, you know, what was it? Is it low flow years? Is it high flow years? Is it um, uh, the number of days that are spent out on the river doing the surveys? But at this point, we can't identify why um, the numbers are off so far in some years. Well, and the hope was when we started to study with the joint districts is that we would be able to come up with, with the actual numbers from the weir. And the weir is pretty accurate. I mean, don't, even at the weir, don't get me wrong, there's, there's issues at the weir. You know, sometimes the film goes down, the electricity, whatever. I mean, we got it. But when you look at it, it's, it's pretty darn accurate. But the goal was, was to say, okay, now that we have this da data, can we go back and look at this data that's been collected by Fish and Game and see that if we could start drawing correlations or analysis to see, you know, are, are, were they always off by, you know, an average of, you know, was it 20 to 40 percent and, and was it a high flow year or low flow? So we could have a better understanding of the data sets that are going to get inputted because quite frankly right now, based on that analysis right there, one would lead, it would lead one to believe that all the data that's being used in the grand tab that's going to be pushed into these life cycle models is already off 40 to 50 percent 
in some years just on one river. And then the problem is if you're off just that much on one river, then you then you got the Tuolumne that you're going to be off on, and then you got the Merced. So then you then you multiply the effects of the problem on each tributary, and you think you're getting an answer down below that really isn't the answer, and that's that's the problem. Yeah. Not to mention, there's also you know we have the the, the trip authority members have made a, a a huge commitment to monitoring. Um, and it started on the Stanislaus 20 years ago, and I think um, in the last 10 years, most of them have made the push to at least try and accurately count the number of fish going in and the number of fish going out. But there's also a lot of other monitoring that's done. For instance, um, carcass surveys that Fish and Game does, we actually go out and do red surveys on both the Stanislaus and the Tuolumne Rivers where we accurately identify the location of each red, um, the depth that fish are spawning in, the gravel size that fish are spawning in, the size of the red, uh, the velocity of the flow, all these factors. And it's surprising to me that when I hear that there's been this new model developed with 20,000 lines of code that, and it was an open and transparent collaborative process, that we have information that we weren't contacted about that seems like it would be valuable to feed into this model. Well, one of the other things, I mean, uh, it, predation's an issue. Okay, so we've heard that predation's an issue or predation's an issue going forward. So when we did the VAMP peer review, the VAMP peer review came out and said, you got to get a handle on what predation's all about or you're not going to get a very good understanding of what's happening to your fish as they move through the system. So to me, it's ironic as we sit here, and I'll let Doug get back on it uh, in a second, is, is that so we know that only roughly 3 to 5 percent of the salmon smolts are making it out of the San Joaquin River and through the South Delta out to the bay. Okay? Now we think in large part it's predation. But what we don't understand is how Fish and Game has built a model when none of us have very good numbers about the m number of predators, where they're located in the system, and not only that, how many fish they're taking by river mile which is extremely important to understand. Where are these hot spots? Where are these fish being taken? And is it due to predation? I mean, is, are 80% of the fish dying on their way out due to predation, or are they dying due to other factors? And so far, nobody's mentioned any other factors, so what do you, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to me that you're going to build a model, say that it's a life cycle model, when we don't even have a basic understanding of predation rates. And well, and it, it sounds like that what was mentioned yesterday, that predation or that predator abundance is a factor in this model, which um, is interesting to me. And again, it's why I'd, I'd like to see it and see how this was handled, because um, we have the, 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 really the only thing that's been learned in the last 20 years that I know of about striped bass was learned um, when the weirs were installed in the tributaries and we suddenly saw these striped bass in springtime in large numbers migrating into the system. So we have um, relative abundance in the last oh, five or eight years on the Stanislaus um, and we have the timing of migration and we have the, the, the size of the fish. But um, before this, not much was known about striped bass in the tributaries. And actually, we know that they live in the tributaries year round, which I think was a surprise to, to most biologists as well. Um, but this made the trip authority members um, curious, and they actually put in a permit application, a 4D application last year, to sample stripers, catch them in the main stem San Joaquin River, um, tag them there, and then have the ability to track them electronically upstream in the other tributaries. And that 4D permit went into Fish and Game and NIMPS, and that research permit was denied. Um, and I th if I recall correctly, the reason that it was denied is because we hadn't collaborated with everybody that we needed to collaborate with, even though we had, we had talked to Marty Gingras, the, I think the head striped bass guy, and um, you know, we had a solid study plan, I believe. Um, considering there's nothing to be known about, not a lot to be known about striped bass in the system, they're a non-native predator, I can't imagine that there would really be concerns about you know, handling practices, mortality, it, it just seems kind of ridiculous when you've got private funds that are stepping up to do research on predation, which is a key issue in the basin, and, and Fish and Game, of all people, would deny us that permit. 
So we look forward to seeing the fishing game Sal Sim 2 model. We, we, we appreciate that they've gone to uh, and agree with us finally that their 1.0 and 1.6 models are entirely worthless and, and are moving forward with a life cycle model because we've always said that life cycle modeling. Unfortunately, we probably don't have hold much hope for it given how they've developed the model. Uh, let's move on to some more positive comments, maybe. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so, sure. I, so I'm confused, Tim. Sure. So the new Salsim is not the best available science that we should wait for. Well, we don't know because we haven't seen it. So we, they've, they've already told you, well, they're fishing games, so you have to give them deference because they're the resource agencies supplying you the information and they're the, the supposed experts on this subject. So you have to give them that uh, deference. But, but you're exactly correct because we won't know. They've said yesterday that 1.0 and 1.6 are no longer the best, but you won't know and I won't know until we sit down and actually see the model that's been done as to whether or not it has any applicability or veracity to the to what you're doing here today. So now that puts you in a conundrum because the conundrum for you is your staff technical report relied on those previous works and now they've told you it's not the best. So I don't know what you're going to do. You had a question? No? I, I, I am going to say positive things before <laughs> I leave. I know. No, no, they're coming. Hey, I, I, I just, uh, there's sometimes when we're throwing numbers around and, and numerics and everything, you know, it's important to, to know about sort of the range of biological relevance. Um, you know, with, with the life cycle models, we're going to get uh, noise in our predictions, right? There's going to be a variance. So um, what I'm a little concerned about is uh, showing graphics that, uh, show such a large percentage difference with the data collection methods when I think we know as professionals we're comfortable with data that are within an order of magnitude sometimes yep. when we're trying to work with biological data that by their very nature vary by orders of magnitude year to year so I, I thought maybe you know for those who haven't looked at a lot of data just to offer up that it's 50% off, 40% off when we're dealing with 20,000 isn't biologically necessarily as relevant as it sounds. I mean, do you have any comments on that? Um, I would say that the highest data point on that graph in terms of Chinook abundance was 5,000. So abundance probably varied from, I want to say, seven or 800 in the one year up to a maximum of 5,000. Um, so it is, um, yeah. Yeah, I, we get the order of magnitude. We understand that collecting this data is extremely difficult. And, and, but but the, the, the problem that we're having is, when, like the people said yesterday, when you're the modeler, how you're putting this stuff in and understanding what that means in the model and what you're expecting to derive from the model is very important. That's, and, that's our point. Yeah, and based and on input data, as the, that, as that, the yeah, invited panel pointed out. And right. our, our other worry is because that there hasn't been a concerted focus on the, the San Joaquin to do as much research and mono, mo, uh, monitoring as there is in other basins, that a lot of the information is going to be borrowed from other basins. And we know that, you know, historically, when we still had San Joaquin Basin fish, and that, that's a legitimate question, when, when we have 80% of the fish showing up, or up to 80% of the fish showing up last year in the San Joaquin Basin or in the Stanislaus Rivers as being hatchery fish, there's a real question of do we really have any Stanislaus River born fish coming back to the Stanislaus River, which begs the question then, what difference does it make what the conditions are in the river? All we have is hatchery fish coming back that we know are not from the Stanislaus River. And if we're just happy, you know, the doubling goal is 22,000 fish for the Stanislaus River. And if we just want 22,000 fish, and if we're okay that they're all hatchery fish, what do the conditions matter in the Stanislaus River? I mean, it's a legitimate question. And the question came up yesterday about carrying capacity. Um, the doubling goal for the Stanislaus is 22,000. The evidence indicates now that the carrying capacity for spawners or juveniles is only 3,000. For, for 20 years, the Oakdale Irrigation District has been monitoring the number of juvenile fish, the number of fry, par, and smolts 
that are exiting the spawning grounds. What we've seen is that if we have over 3,000 adults, we're not producing any more juveniles. So the river at this point can't sp support more than 3,000 spawners or the juveniles from those 3,000 spawners. So our goal is 22,000. Our, our spawning capacity or our carrying capacity is 3,000. So the question is also, well, what's the other 19,000 for? Well, and that we're going to see it this year, and we'll provide an update to the board, uh, and it'll be on the website as well that we maintain. But, you know, we're going to start seeing superimposition this year, probably on the Stanislaus River, given the number of returns that we've, we've seen. What do you, what, I don't know what that term is. Uh, superimposition is basically when a red is made, and then a later uh, spawning cycle occurs on top of it. So you superimpose one red on top of another red. So if you had them separately, you would, you would, you would estimate or guess that you're going to get, uh, you know, a certain amount of production of both, but when they're over each other, you're not because it leads to problems with oxygen and nutrients and survival and a whole bunch of other things. And that, I think, is another key model input when you, when you look at that, the, the spawning um, phase that we're interested in having, uh, you know, the fecundity of fish, the size of fish, um, superimposition is an important one. And as far as I know, that's not measured by any state or federal agency. The irrigation districts are the ones that measure that. So we're the ones that have that information. And again, there's this, the, a new model out there and nobody's contacted us asking for our, our, our information, our data on red superimposition. I don't, I, 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 I totally get that you've got good information that, that folks need to, and, and we'll, we'll certainly be asking the fish and wildlife or a uh, fish and game and fish and wildlife uh, as to what they're, you know, what, why this is happening. But <laughs> it, it does seem to me that there's a, um, there, there is a, a complete, there's, there's, <laughs> there's not much trust one to the other and the other to the one. No. It, oh, I think that, it, that's exactly true. And so, and so it makes it very hard, it makes it from us, in terms of scientific collaboration, which we're talking about, which means not biased toward one going in one direction or the other, you know, trying to get the best possible information out there. Um, so, and we heard about this yesterday, you know, if, if we're going to do adaptive management, we're going to need to um, take in information, evaluate it fairly, make changes as uh, if, if, if needed. And, um, and I, you know, you, you, I think you guys need to be part of this deliberation, but it, it is going to, um, it, it may be a challenge from, from your constituents' perspective because it, you, you well, may come up well, with, well, well, with decisions <laughs> that, that they don't but, like. But, Fran, there's a reason for it, excuse me, is, is there's a reason for this. So we've actually written letters to the Department of Interior, NIMS, and our congressional delegation about this. Last, last year, not this year, but the year previous, we wrote a letter and said, you know, you're releasing these waters. You're going to have problems uh, come fall with dewatering reds in the Stanislaus River. And we wrote the letter in July. The, the SOG, the group that is supposedly adaptively managing the Stanislaus River under the NIMS biological opinion, uh, basically took our work and threw it in the trash, okay? So then what happened is we're the only ones out on the river. We're actually measuring the reds. We got a bunch of bureaucrats sitting in a desk and uh, in, in not out on the river, not understanding where the reds are located, and we documented uh, the dewatering of how many reds was it? Twelve percent. Twelve percent of the reds. So you're sitting here, the state board's beating up on us, telling us to get water out, and we're sitting there saying, well, wait, you know, we have these reds in the system, the, the fish are spawning, and then they take a management action, which we told them about 60 days ahead of time, and all of a sudden 12% of the fish are dewatered, or the reds are dewatered. Well, there's a reason that there's distrust, and, and, and this goes to this whole deal of adaptive management. You know, the other thing we do is we post all of our data immediately. Well, we have a rotary screw trap on the Stanislaus River. We still don't have their data, and that's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So this trust thing is kind of an interesting thing. I mean, we're public agencies 
by the state of California. Our information is out there. It's available. We run our website. You can go on Fish Bio anytime. You can see all the data on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. We're not getting the reciprocity that you're talking about. And, and so that's one of my statements that you're going to hear about this adaptive management. How are we going to get to adaptive management if we have these, these kinds of issues and this kind of distrust? I mean, like, quite frankly, I'll be tell you, yeah, I didn't know about SALSIM 2. Did you know about SALSIM 2? Because I think you would have done your whole San Joaquin River Basin process entirely different if you knew a life cycle model that was coming out that basically said that what you'd relied upon isn't, isn't correct. So that, that's my, I, we have to move on. I, I do want to make some points uh, on some other things. <laughs> okay, yesterday. Uh, kind stuff going to come out. What? When's this kind stuff going to come out? Right now. <laughs> uh, yesterday, uh, Mr. Kane made a presentation um, and talked about smart, uh, specific, um, measurable, uh, Achievable, relevant, and time-based. We fully support that. Uh, it's one of the things we've been pounding on for the last three years, which is you had a panel in front, of, in front of you that talked about flow and functionality. And to us, if you're going to be setting water quality objectives, it seems to us that you have to look at the functionality of the flow. So you can look at dissolved oxygen, you can look at temperature, you can look at nutrients, you can look at turbidity, and even floodplain habitat, if you think that's a water quality objective that needs to be included. But I, we agree that you have to be specific. And so far, what we, well, we don't know because we haven't seen all of your document, but what we've seen from your document so far is it's not going to be specific. So, you know, we support that because if you're, if you think, and I've told uh, you this, Fran, is that if you think you're going to release these flows and get a certain amount of floodplain and a certain amount of benefit, and in fact you're not, you as a policy person should know that. So you can make an informed decision that, gee, if it's 30% unimpaired flow, I'm not going to get the floodplain I wanted. I'm only going to get 5,000 acres. I thought I was going to get 20,000 acres. And conversely, with water temperatures, with dissolved oxygens, and then we have a problem. And the other problem is this, is with nutrients and turbidity. I, I found it ironic in workshop two, we wrote you a memo on this, that people are now saying that the San Joaquin River is this golden child, I guess, because I didn't know that it was this <laughs> here to for we'd been just cremated in every regional board process that we've gone, gone through. But so now turbidity is, is, we want turbidity, or it sounds like we want turbidity, but we have a regional board order no turbidity, and we're heading to TMDLs. So it's the same thing with nutrients. We're heading to that. And then we ran into the dissolved oxygen thing about uh, phytoplankton. So we did a report, and we submitted it to the regional board, and we said, you know, we're producing lots of phytoplankton, but it's not getting out. So, you know, if, if the delta is phytoplankton starved, how is it that we can get our, our stuff out? But we can't do it because under your dissolved oxygen TMDL, we're, uh, we're not allowed to do it. So one of the things you're going to have to think about, if those are things that you want to see moving forward, you already have water quality objectives in place that say no. So you're going to have to think about that. So that gets to the smart, achievable, uh, relevant, and time-based. Um, you will find this probably ironic. Um, we, we agree with CSWIN and CALSPA. Um, you, now, we don't agree with the analysis, and we probably don't agree with the conclusions. But we do agree with the basic fundamental premise of what they've put in front of you. And we've been harping on this point, too, uh, to the board about the Racanelli decision. And, um, and I'm just going to, I dug it up again this morning. It says, in performing its dual role, including development of water quality objectives, which you're doing here, the board is directed to consider not only the availability of unappropriated water, but also underlying emphasis by the court all competing demands for water in determining what is a reasonable level of water quality as well as all past, present, and probable future uses. And, and the board even understood that, you know, you guys would probably freak out. The Racanelli said, God, they're going to freak out when they hear how, how much water rights they have to delve into. But the, the next quote says, the board need only take the larger view of the water resources in arriving at a reasonable estimate of all water uses. You haven't done that. 
you, you, that's nowhere in your SED, that's nowhere in your analysis for the San Joaquin River Basin. Uh, even D1641 had tables outlining what the water rights were in the basin and how those individual water rights may be affected by a decision that would be made by you, and you don't have that, or at least we don't think you do. Um, next one is CalSim 2. Uh, we support CalSim 2. Now, CalSim 2 got beat up yesterday, and there's problems with the model. But if you look at the San Joaquin River Basin, every major project that has moved forward or is moving forward uses CalSim 2. Our understanding is you haven't used CalSim 2, so you haven't used the best available model for the basin. Uh, swap. Um, we, it was nice to hear from Mr. Sundin yesterday. Um, we made the exact same comments, probably not as scientifically or eloquently as he did, in regards to the San Joaquin River Basin. And I want to give you an example of how two of these things kind of work together. So I'm going to use the Stanislaus as an example. If you take C-SWIN's analysis, and, and I'm not saying it's correct, but if you just take a, a general analysis of what they did, one could opine that the CVP contractors, which would be Central San Joaquin Water Conservation District and Stockton East, under certain prescriptions that you may uh, apply, would not get any water, okay? So they're cut off, and so now they don't get any water. So now you turn to SWAP. Well, SWAP says you can pump basically unlimited groundwater. The problem is, in that basin, you're already in a critically overdrafted groundwater basin. So groundwater isn't unlimited, and in fact, groundwater tr intrusion is a major problem in the city of Stockton already in regards to their municipal supply, uh, and, and so you have that problem. So that's the importance for the board when you go back and you're doing your water quality objectives, you have to understand where th the impacts may fall. Because on the Stanislaus, quite honestly, they're not going to fall on Oakdale Irrigation District and South San Joaquin Irrigation District. They're going to fall on the contractors. And so you're going to have that little portion of eastern San Joaquin County that will have no water, and then uh, you're going to push them to groundwater in an overdrafted basin. And your analysis has it, hasn't looked at that because you haven't done the first analysis. Um, I think the adaptive management exchange was excellent. It fits in. I, you know, we did VAMP. If we're going to go down this road and you're going to have an adaptive management piece, you're going to have to, uh, a great many resources, time, and a lot of barriers are going to have to be broken down to get to that point. I, I firmly believe that. Um, other, other models, um, to be used in the San Joaquin River Basin. It's, it's interesting that almost all the models we heard about over the last several days, my understanding is that your staff has incorporated or not used any of them in your analysis of the San Joaquin River Basin, which is kind of ironic, given that the models are available and can help lend you to understand what kind of trade-offs you may be making in regards to certain flows and what, what you're getting. And then lastly, um, on the San Joaquin River flow modeling, I thought the presentation yesterday with the particle tracking model that you saw at the end was very interesting where it basically shows that San Joaquin River water comes down and none of it makes it to the bay. Um, we supplied that information to you approximately almost eight or nine years ago in a written form, uh, but visually I, I have to say it's much more appealing. But here's, here's another problem or conundrum for you. Um, you have segmented, seg segmented these uh, problems out. Previously, when we were looking at basin plan objectives, it was incorporated into a basin plan. But now you're dealing with this San Joaquin River phase one above Vernalis, and you're only looking at three of the trips. Um, but how do you take the information like that chart and incorporate it into phase one? Or conversely, how do you take what we do in phase one and incorporated in phase two. Because our understanding is that once phase one is over, the San Joaquin River component is done. So if that's the case, then you have to understand what that would look like feeding into how the delta would look in those change conditions. It's my understanding that phase one is phase one of several phases and that the water rights 